Thank you, David and others, for inviting us um, to give you, I mean, in full disclosure, I've been uh, in this post for seven months, so I'm not sure that I can give you exemplars around this work, but instead uh, treat it as sort of the journey that we're on in Sac City related to the effective use of LCFF funds. Um, and then I'll let my colleagues who've been in their post for more than seven months talk about uh, some exemplars. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, a statement that I inherited, and I feel really privileged that I inherited this statement. Um, I uncovered it during my interview prep process. I want you to just take 30 seconds to read um, our core value statement in Sac City Unified. And of course, when I asked our senior team and our board members, um, what do you think about this value statement? Some board members thought that it was my statement. They hadn't paid attention to it. They hadn't been informed about it. Um, my assumption was that uh, what our staff were referring to was sort of just the um, history of education and how we came about having bells and all of that kind of stuff. And in fact, they said, no, no, we, we actually got together and thought that we had designed a system that was inequitable. And I said, okay, well, I get that the outcomes are inequitable, but what part of the system is inequitable? And in fact, that um, has no answer today, and that's sort of the journey that we're on. Um, so the journey we're on comes back to this very powerful statement about what does it mean when we say that we have designed an, a system that is inequitable. Um, so um, I like data, um, so I'm gonna go through three very quick case studies. Um, this is a case study of a young middle school student. Um, of course, we're using early warning system data, um, and uh, you can see that uh, this particular um, uh, young girl who's Hispanic and is an English learner uh, was doing very well uh, in each of the three early warning system criteria, academic, behavior, and attendance. Um, and then um, you can see last year uh, becomes chronically absent, um, starts showing deficiencies in uh, ELA and mathematics, and also begins to display negative behavior. Uh, this is another uh, case study of an elementary student. Um, who had not met all three criteria of the early warning system, but quickly began to show deficiencies in each of the three criteria. And so all of this is in the context of, so what have we designed as a system to respond to these types of students? Um, and then I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about this young woman. She happens to be Latina, so I actually baptized her. Instead of Jane Doe, I called her Eugenia Doe. Um, and um, this is a very uh, powerful case study for uh, me because um, this is a young woman who's a senior, uh, so class of 2008 right now, attends one of our high schools, so it's JFK, uh, John F. Kennedy. Um, and you can see that in her educational history, uh, we have records that she came to Sac City as a sixth grader, um, which you can see Oops, I'm not sure, you can see it here, sorry, sixth grade. And she's an English learner. You can see that in sixth grade on herself, um, she received an early advance, was doing quite well in terms of working toward mastery of English. And every year after that, except for the eighth grade when something happened with herself, uh, she scored advanced uh, every single year and she's a senior today. Um, she is still an English learner because she hasn't met the internal assessment criteria for Sac City. So she's a long-term English learner, um, having evidence that in the state assessment she has scored advanced for the past three, four years. This is, for, for me, in terms of the spirit of LCFF, a, a real social injustice, educational inequity as well. So the question again back to how have we designed a system that is inequitable? Um, 
Mike Kirst talked about this separation between higher ed and lower ed. And part of what we have in our design is to create a co connect that, that fundamental disconnect between higher ed and, uh, and, and K-12. Um, and full disclosure, I spent most of my career in higher ed, actually. Um, so this is of great interest to me. Um, and the way that we've done it is uh, we've laid out a multi-metric accountability system uh, uh, for which we will then uh, measure the value of how we utilize LCFF funding. And for English learners, we're not just looking at how many more English learners do we redesignate year after year. Instead, we're looking at five very specific sub-elements. And you can see one of them, for example, is how many students can our system produce that are borderline eligible for redesignation? That is, that they might meet the state criteria, but not the local criteria. Or they meet the local criteria, but not the state criteria. So how are we increasing the pool of eligible students toward redesignation? And how are we using LCFF funds to accomplish that? There's another sub-element here, which is Again, in, in my own vision, how we're advancing educational equity and social justice, which is that once we have evidence that a student meets this borderline eligibility criteria, can we redesignate that child in 365 days? As opposed to Eugenia, who's been an English learner for six years now. Um, our ALTAL redesignation rate, and then I want to focus on on this other sub-element, which is, you know, having come from the higher ed sector, uh, really, frankly, we never paid attention to whether a student was an LTEL or not. Whether a K-12 had failed a child and had kept the student as a long-term EL. So what we have begun to do is determine how it is that we build a system that takes LTEL students, that they're not under our care, say in higher ed, how does K-12 take that child and say, well, if we didn't accomplish redesignation for you, can we at least show evidence that we are putting you on track for graduation and for A to G? Because whether you go to Sac City or CSU Sacramento or UC Davis, it's not really going to matter that you're a long-term EL. There might be evidence in the placement test and all of those things, but that's why I'm very motivated by Eloy's philosophy of being careful about the use of placement tests. And so this particular young girl, you can see in terms of her A to G uh, course history, was doing very, very well, ninth grade, 10th grade, started to falter in the 11th grade, and then um, is only one semester shy of completing the A to G course pattern as a senior. And so we, this past semester, one of the first decisions I made was to take every single child like Eugenia and figure out a way in which we put them back on track through credit recovery or other opportunities, uh, despite the fact that we may not redesignate those students before they graduate. Now, um, we have begun to use and aggregate all of these case studies and uh, look at uh, five areas in which we're um, looking at the development of data indices. Uh, one is in the area of facilities. One is in the area of IT, uh, staffing, student services, and of course, academic achievements. I'm gonna give you an example of the kind of data we're aggregating to develop these data indices to inform us of how to better and more effectively use LCFF funds. Uh, so this is just a sampling of the kind of data elements we're including in these uh, uh, indices. So for example, how many of our teachers and at which schools do we have the highest percentage of teachers who are absent more than 10 days out of the academic year. So just looking at which of our schools have the highest percentage of teachers who are absent more than 10 days. So obviously, I mean, that's, that's an important 
uh, 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 finding in, in, in research. And these are just sample data elements. Um, which of our schools have the lowest percentage of teachers with five um, years of experience? Obviously with the right professional learning as well. Uh, which of our schools have the highest percentage of teacher vacancies? So, sort of adult-centric data points for these indices. And then some compounding data elements. Um, um, sorry, this is a real critical question that I've been asking our staff as well as our Board of Education is, why would we look at these data elements and aggregate data put weights on them and conduct analytics, right? And, and so we're sort of clear, we've had some creative conflict, that we're trying to make up for something by looking at those data elements. We're trying to make up for something. And there's disagreements about what we're trying to make up for, but trying to make up for something. You take those types of data elements and you add some compounding data elements, like which of the schools that have the highest percentage of teachers who are absent more than 10 days, the lowest percentage of teachers with five years experience, the highest percentage of schools with teacher vacancies and long-term subs, and on top of that, the highest schools with the highest percentage of LCFF count students, or the highest percentage of students with severely chron who are severely chronically absent, or students that meet all three criteria of an early warning system. And of personal concern to me being in Sacramento um, is um, also working with colleagues, uh, researchers uh, that um, are doing work around human trafficking and which of our students are most at risk for, for human trafficking. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is answer the question, you know, what are we trying to make up for? How are we gonna make up for whatever we decide we're trying to make up for uh, using these indices? Right, which is a very, very hard question to answer. Um, and so we're in the development of these very robust databases uh, where we'll be able to um, try to advance some innovation, right? Which of these factors should we weigh more than others? Which one should we weigh equally? And then perform some analytics to look at which of these schools that I'm responsible for have the highest deficits uh, with the lowest achievement uh, levels, for example. And then take every one of those dots, you know, we have about 70 uh, schools, and see how we can then use this information to inform us about how to better utilize LCFF resources in answering this question, these questions of how, uh, or I'm sorry, what are we trying to make up for when we look at these data elements and we aggregate them together, um, and then how, and, and so the how, there's two, uh, two, 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 two how questions. The first one is, I'm very clear that it's by more effectively integrating three budget processes uh, that, um, that I think are critical. And those are um, the SIPSAs, SPSAs, which in most traditional uh, K-12 systems uh, are usually managed by state and federal. Right? Um, and the LCAP, which in most traditional K-12 systems is managed by some other person. And then the district budget, which is managed by yet another person, a CBO or a CFO. And we're trying our best, and maybe uh, Nancy uh, uh, and Al can talk about, because we're actively looking for exemplars for how to more effectively integrate these three critical budget processes once we have access to these powerful analytics using these five indices that that we've begun to do in Sac City. So again, I said I don't have a lot of exemplars, but uh, hopefully we'll be on a learning journey together and, and, and you can um, look up, see what we're doing over the course of the next year. So with that, thank you.